एक्सक्लूसिव फ्रॉम द स्टार ट्रेड टाइम्स Natalis, a San Diego-based company developing the world's first purposefully designed and manufactured autonomous aircraft to dramatically reduce both the cost and environmental impact of air freight, just announced advanced purchase commitments of more than six billion dollars for the delivery of over 440 aircraft in pre-orders. Volatis Aerospace, Astral Aviation, Aurora. Diamond and Flexport are the customers who have placed orders for Natalis family of unmanned autonomous aircraft of four types that include the 3.8 ton payload short haul feeder aircraft to the 130 ton payload long range aircraft. Interestingly, Flexport, the digital freight forwarder which recently completed a 935 million dollar series E funding round signed a letter of intent with Natalis for 200 ton payload long range Natalis aircraft with an option for a third Natalis integrates three specific technologies to create increased efficiencies blended wing body design remote pilot operation and standard container standardization the Natalis 3.8 ton payload aircraft offers an estimated 60% more cargo volume than traditional aircraft of the same weight while reducing cost and carbon dioxide per pound by 50%. The aircraft has completed the second wind tunnel test and the first flight of the full scale prototype will be in 2023. Natalis expects to begin the first deliveries in 2025. Natalis aircraft uses the existing ground infrastructure and standard air cargo containers making Natalis products a turnkey solution for the global freight industry. Founded in 2016 by Alexei Matyushev and Anatoly Starikov, Natalis aims to democratize freight transport by making cargo transportation by air more efficient. Alexei Matyushev, the co-founder and CEO of Natalis joins me from san diego to discuss the significance of the 6 billion dollar worth of pre order the timeline for the delivery of natalis autonomous aircraft and how the company intends to offer a compelling alternative cargo transport solution that is environmentally more sustainable and economically more viable alexi uh, thanks for uh, finding time to talk to us uh, uh, my first question is uh, just place in context the announcement yesterday about the 6 billion us dollar commitment for uh, pre orders for some of your aircraft yeah so it's a big announcement for nautilus uh it's something that we've been working on for the, the last couple of years specifically working you know from a very beginning with a couple of airlines to help develop the products and obviously those relations kind of grew a little bit further to the point that when the product the products were frozen uh, there was a lot of interest in actually uh creating these pre-purchase agreements with a lot of these folks so it's the first time we were kind of been able to announce the, the magnitude of it across the entire family of products I see from your release that it is uh, it's six billion in terms of the value and about four hundred and forty aircraft. Uh, can you give us a a, a breakup of what is that four hundred and forty aircraft of different types that you have? I think you have four types of aircraft. Right. So uh, the bulk of the order book is actually the number wise is centered around the the first product, the three point eight ton feeder aircraft. But the value of the order book, uh, being the uh, the larger airplane is more expensive, uh, is actually centered around the sixty to hundred and one hundred and thirty ton products. Can you tell us uh, your mix of customers? We do see a uh, some big uh, uh, digital freight forwarders like Flexport that coming in, and your announcement came just a few days after Flexport announced almost a close to a billion dollar investment uh, on an eight billion valuation. Uh, can you tell us about the mix of customers that you have, and uh, it's also said that uh, there will be more customers added in the in the coming months. Yeah, we haven't announced all of our customers, and um, you know we'll kind of wait a little bit further down the line of uh, the company progress to make a couple of the bigger name announcements. But you know, Flexport is a digital freight forwarder, but they've always been interested in you know streamlining the entire supply chain. I think the Nautilus products give them a really interesting opportunity to help you know uh, reduce some of the pain points that we've seen specifically in the port of Los Angeles. So I think it's an opportunity for them, and it's something that they're exploring uh, vividly. And then the, yeah, most of our other customers is kind of the, the traditional, I would call them the integrators and the airlines. And so those are more, I guess, um, expected customers for Nautilus. 
of the four categories that you have, uh, where is the largest interest coming in? Probably you may not have the orders for that, but in terms of the interest uh, or in terms of what you perceive would be greatest numbers, uh, number of orders coming for which of the categories? Is it the lowest in terms of the payload or it's got the highest? Well, it's actually, uh, it's, it's two extremes. So, uh, you know, because the first product is a little bit more closer to, to getting to first flight, the 3.8 ton feeder, and the closest to customer delivery, we're seeing a very large interest in that product uh, because it's just a little bit faster, or I'm sorry, more forward uh, in the customer pipeline. But the uh, also the exciting part is, uh, you know, the industry is looking really looking forward to towards the 100 ton solution. And I know that Boeing 777X is coming out, which is very exciting, but it still leaves a lot of gaps in the supply chain. And uh, I think a lot of customers are thinking that our product being a purpose built aircraft is going to be a very good solution. Alexei, tell us also about the timing of this. It's not that you have timed it because it's been the last two years that we have really seen global supply chains and logistics really getting headlines across uh, across media. We have seen how important it is. We have seen also the freight rates really going up. People are looking for alternate solutions. People are looking for uh, um, cost efficient solution. To that extent, uh, how do you see uh, your product, your innovation really shaping up for the future of uh, freight, which is going to be digital? Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, obviously the digital aspects of, of freight, specifically the, the the paperwork side of it, right? But I you know for our perspective too, the airplane is built entirely on digital technologies. Uh, so we're rethinking a lot of the, just the internal cargo base section. There's all of a sudden touchscreen pads everywhere, uh, kind of helping automate a lot of that process and positioning the cargo and, and the right location for weight and balance, as well as just automating as many of the tasks, the mundane tasks around the airplane as we can, while at the same time being able to fit into the existing ground support uh, equipment that our airline customers are using today. One of the biggest USPs for your product is cost. You are literally competing with the air freight, but Air freight as well as sea freight. On sea freight, you are competing in terms of uh, cost plus uh, the speed. And even on the air freight, you are significantly reducing the cost of moving up a kg of, uh, of cargo from place A to place B. Uh, to that extent, um, you're competing with the two biggest, uh, biggest plane makers in the world. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a very exciting field to play in. Um, obviously, you know, Boeing and Airbus produce really great products uh, and they're purpose built for the passenger market, which is like, they've done a great job for it. But when it comes to cargo, you know, the advantage that Nautilus has is uh, the zero contour around the, the cargo pallet. So it's a rectangular cargo based section fitting in rectangular cargo. So those losses of efficiencies, which don't seem very significant at first, but when you start adding them up across the entire network are very significant. And that's the really the, the cost advantage of our product is we're able to transport more revenue cargo per flight. And so that's really the, the, the thing that gets our customers excited about it is the same engine technology, but a different airframe. And that's really what creates the value behind our products. You know, Alexi, it's also interesting to note that there's a lot of vertical integration that is happening within the, the freight industry. You see mergers, acquisitions, you see the sea freight ocean carriers really getting into the air freight, purchasing new models of uh, placing orders for new freighter models. Uh, do you see interest from any of those players for all of your products? Because they probably can address different market sizes, different geographies, different customers. Yeah, that's absolutely the case is, uh, you know, our customers are global uh, and, you know, everything from Africa to Asia uh, to here in, in North American region. So that's kind of the intent of our products is being able to capture uh, the, or help, you know, solve the supply chain inefficiencies on a global level. Do you think uh, there's still a common perception that this is still science fiction, even though we see uh, smaller cargo drones like zip lines and others really doing medical deliveries in remote locations in Africa that has really become a, a hotbed for a lot of innovation on the on the drone very these are not proof of concept project but these are real application of uh, deployment of smaller cargo drones for of medical and humanitarian logistics so, so do you think that uh, there is a real case for uh, for freight forwarding and logistic industry to take these innovations. Yeah, I think it's actually even a stronger case than what we see in uh, you know the smaller what we call the drunk consumer space with the medical supply deliveries. And 
The reason is, you know, um, just even on the feeder aircraft level, the, the amount of pilots entering the workforce is, you know, it's just only getting lower and lower. So autonomy is kind of the solution of the future to make sure that there is, uh, I mean, th there's agility in actually supply chains to, to scale up. So I think autonomy is definitely the future. Uh, and then as far as the new configuration, the sci-fi aspect of it, I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, new configurations being developed over the last, I'd say 20, 30 years in the military sector, but none of them have really made their way into the commercial sector. So the, the science fiction behind the look of the airplane has already been tested. It's just uh, Boeing and Airbus, you know, continue to make great passenger airplanes. And those two are just very different things when you think about freight. So, Combining the, the new configuration, the look of it with the autonomy portion is really, I would say, a very low risk solution. It's just a question of who's going to accomplish it. And I think we're the, probably the best positioned in the market to really do that. Tell us also about the timelines for four of your uh, products that you already have. Uh, already, I think the prototype is ready. What is the kind of uh, timeline that you have for these? And you said 2025 is the first one that would be commercially launched. And what will be the timeline for the others? So 2025 is the first customer delivery of the, the first product. And then um, our typical cadence uh, is planned for the company. Uh, again, planned is about four to five years for the, the other products. So the 60 ton, you know, closer to 2030. Five years after that, 2035 will be the, the 100 ton product. But there's also opportunities in the market, um, you know, taking a look at the, the actual cargo aircraft space or freighter space over the next 20 years, we might flip some products around in our production schedule. So there's opportunities to maybe look at the 100 ton first ahead of the 60 ton. So that really depends on the customers and kind of what we see as a market development over the next kind of 10, 15 years. Do you continue to remain as a manufacturer of these aircraft or would you be also getting into the operation part of it? Would we be a, a Boeing and Airbus in the autonomous UAV sector or will you also be an operator? Right now, we're looking at ourselves as an aircraft manufacturer. Uh, there's definitely opportunities for us to grow into an operational role, but right now it's not something that we're thinking about. Where will you be getting your aircraft manufactured? Do you have the factories ready? Where do you have identified if you have to elsewhere take the production? Where will that be? So we're looking um, at a lot of opportunities here in North America, as well as on the global level. Uh, so it just depends. The, you know, the two largest markets for the feeder aircraft are, of course, Asia and then North America. And, uh, you know, it might make sense for us uh, to break up some of the production facilities for the smaller aircraft on a geographical level to kind of help, uh, help meet the demand across those two continents. Alexi, for those of us uh, who are readers as well as people who watch up with like hearing Natalis for the first time, uh, tell us uh, besides the cost efficiencies that you bring in, what are the other efficiencies and operational ease that you bring your, your product brings in terms of cargo handling, cargo movement, and that's where uh, it's, a, it's a really a value proposition for someone to take your product. Well, I think one of the largest advantages is actually uh, CO2. So that's been kind of a huge buzzword in the industry is going green. Um, there's a lot of, you know, technologies that are being looked at and, uh, you know, uh, electrification, hydrogen being, and SAP, of course, being the three that come to mind. But, you know, just using existing engine technologies, uh, because of the revenue cargo that we're able to capture for the same routes, We've looked at fleets and networks and actually like a traditional all freight cargo carrier might be able to reduce their fleet size by 40% just purchasing Nautilus aircraft, but it's still being able to meet the same um, demand, I guess, uh, throughput through their network. So that's a huge advantage for them on the bottom line of the airline, specifically as far as fuel costs. And more importantly, on a global level, in the production of CO2 emissions while still getting the same job done. Tell us also about the infrastructure that is required. Are you able to your your aircraft would be able to use the existing airport infrastructure to move around to, to load the cargo, unload cargo, and then take off. Is that the is that the scenario for all of your four products? Yeah, it is. So we spent a lot of time working with our uh, future customers, uh, spending time on the ground on the tarmac with them, and really understanding how important a lot of this ground support equipment is. If there's opportunities to make things better. Uh, the way that we see things right now, the current ground support equipment has, uh, is, although it's relatively simple, it's doing a great job. So we use existing um, loaders, uh, we use existing um, aircraft, I'm sorry, air cargo containers, uh, all the fuel trucks are all the same. So it's essentially, it's a turnkey solution to our customers. And while there is certain percentage or certain ways to optimize it, um, the amount of technology they're introducing and complexity into either our products or the ground support equipment is not really worth the reward.
Tell us also about a little more about uh, the technology that is deployed. People are keen to know what it is. It is called um, unmanned autonomous, uh, I don't know, do you call it autonomous areas, aerial vehicle or aerial aircraft? Uh, what do you call it? And tell us about the technology part of it and to what extent you have finalized, you have a solution ready already. Yeah, so the way that uh, the regulators are thinking about us is something called a remotely piloted aircraft system or RPAS. And so the thinking behind it is that although there is nobody in the cockpit, there's still a remote operator, a pilot typically, uh, maintaining um, oversight over the aircraft and also commuting with air traffic control. So the aircraft flies itself autonomously, which is what most passenger aircraft do today in the world. It's just we're removing the pilot out of the cockpit and putting him in, in front of a computer somewhere else. And so with that kind of in mind, we have a lot of safety features that we're developing uh, as far as loss of link and loss of communication. And uh, also operationally, we're working with the FAA to figure out exactly how to structure it in such a manner that it, it actually, in, it's a better level of safety, safety than traditional manned aviation. So I think that's the grown in-house system that Nautilus is focusing on developing along with the new blended wing body configuration. Alexi, tell us about uh, how confident are you to keep your timeline, uh, keeping in mind also FAA and the other regulators, uh, European Union regulation, and probably uh, countries in Africa where you have customers. Uh, how confident are you that they would probably give you a green signal for, uh, for your product? I think the regulators, uh, what's really challenging for them is they're, you know, this is kind of a new technology that's kind of leaping uh, from the military sector with the unmanned aircraft into the commercial sector. And for them, um, they've been wary to develop regulations because there's really been not a lot of products in existence. And so they don't want to stagnate the industry and, you know, creating the first level of regulations without actually seeing products on the market. So I think the, that both the European um, aviation authorities, as well as the FAA here in the United States, as well as Chinese aviation, Japanese, they're all, you know, just waiting for the first product to fly and seeing that system developed and robust and in the air allows them to kind of go back and work with the, the companies that have developed those systems and really develop the next generation of regulations. Um, as an example, here in the United States, that's already been done. There's a path forward for certification. And so we're kind of just looking for the products then to really mature and take flight. And then I think it'll spread really quickly across the globe. The kind of order that you have received a commitment for 6 billion, 440 plus um, uh, aircraft on order and to scale your business, scale your um, innovation really big at a global scale, uh, you would need a lot of uh, money to come in. Uh, are you adequately funded? Yeah, we are. So uh, everything is going well on the financial side. I think the last two years, what's really been incredible is uh, I think the venture capital society or uh, groups have really realized the importance of these supply chains, especially when VCs go down to the store or Ikea to purchase food or furniture and the shelves are empty. And so this problem, I think, really got uh, put on the front of their mind. And I think there's renewed interest to fund innovation in the logistics and supply chain um, innovation. Do you think you will have a passenger version of it in the future? <laughs> we'll leave that for the next time, Raj. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alexi. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for uh, to find time to talk to us. Thank you so much. Take care. This is all for the moment. For the latest news on air freight, keep visiting stattimes.com. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram. Visit and subscribe our YouTube channel for exclusive one-to-one -one interviews with global logistic leaders and for recordings of all our past webinars and virtual conferences.